Hi, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, my name is Andrea Castillo. I'm a reporter uh, covering immigration at the Los Angeles Times. Um, this is uh, the, a webinar by the UCLA Latino Policy and Politics Initiative exploring how undocumented immigrants are vulnerable to disasters um, and should require special consideration in emergency planning and relief efforts. Um, joining me this morning is uh, Dr. Michael Mendez, an assistant professor of environmental policy and planning at the University of California in Irvine. Uh, we've also got Genevieve Flores Haro, um, who serves as the associate director for the Misteco Indigena Community Organizing Project, uh, which is a nonprofit serving the California Central Coast's indigenous migrant community. Um, we've also got Ana Tovar, uh, who is currently serving as the mayor of Tolleston, Arizona, um, and is also a former state senator representing the 19th district. Uh, and last but not least, we've also got Valdemar Velasquez, who's uh, an American labor union activist. Um, he co-founded and is president of the Farm Labor Organizing Committee, the AFL-CIO. Uh, and, and now I'd like to introduce uh, Sonia Diaz, who is the founding director of the UCLA Latino Policy and Politics Initiative for opening remarks. Thanks so much, Andrea. Thanks for moderating this discussion. Um, everybody who is joining, we are all devastated about the impact that natural disasters continue to have on our communities across the country and frankly across the world. But what's particularly concerning for us is the role of immigrants, those that are vulnerable, and that are too often in the shadows, who face so many threats by not only climate change, but by pandemics. And natural disasters are traumatic. They're life-altering experiences for anybody, but they can be impossible to overcome for undocumented immigrants who really don't have access to the support or insurance to really rebuild and recover. Yet, they're forced to continue to work in unsafe conditions. We've seen on the West Coast migrant workers toil in the fields without personal protective equipment. We've seen this year after year with climate change. What's different is we're dealing with a global pandemic. And yet the onus is still on them to show up to keep many of us not only comfortable, but to ensure that the American economy continues to function for which without their service and their labor, it simply would not. As wildfires continue to rage up and down the West Coast, farm workers are in the fields putting food on our tables. That's the same with workers in service and retail and other low-wage skill industries. And the ash and smoke have worsened our air quality at a time when we're dealing with a global pandemic in COVID-19 only exacerbating health issues for community that is least likely to have access to health insurance, let alone quality health care. Now we've seen during COVID-19 that the brunt of this pandemic has laid bare racial disparities. This is true for black and brown communities across this nation. Essential should not mean expendable. And today we're lucky to have a dynamic panel of experts to talk about what resiliency looks like when we include everybody in that conversation. Now, we know that protecting our immigrants is a clear moral imperative. It's something that the Ninth Circuit got wrong this week, but it's also an economic necessity. Research out of UCLA showed that if we would have included mixed status families in COVID-19 relief and recovery, the economy would have had a net gain of $10 billion and 80,000 jobs. So when we leave them out on purpose because of racial animus, we're all losing out. Today's panel is really gonna have a necessary spotlight on this topic. I thank all of them for ensuring that we have the advocates with the data and facts necessary to drive this nation forward at a time that is unseen, unheard of, and unparalleled in American history. And I turn it over to our colleagues, and I'm so excited to have our expert, Dr. Michael Mendez, really focusing in with this conversation and to have Andrea moderate. So thanks everybody for joining, please stay safe. Great, thank you, Sonia. Um, let's start it off with uh, Dr. Mendez and Genevieve, you both recently published 
a report called The Invisible Victims of Disaster, Understanding the Vulnerability of Undocumented Latino and Indigenous Immigrants. Um, I'd like to ask you two to describe your key findings and takeaways from that report. Uh, let's start with Dr. Mendez. Sure, thank you, uh, Andrea, for this opportunity uh, to speak to you about uh, this important issue. And thank you to the UCLA Latino Politics and Policy Initiative, which is one of the leading research centers and the University of California system focusing specifically on Latinos and migrant and undocumented communities. So I thank you for the work and the spotlight that you're uh, bringing to this important issue of the most vulnerable communities. I think what we're seeing really on uh, now uh, with the onset of climate change is a, a really a climate emergency and the compounding of disasters, both from wildfires and the unhealthy air quality, the heat waves, and of course the ever-present um, uh, pandemic. And quite frankly, oftentimes with these uh, environmental disasters and, and crises, uh, you could move away and get away from some of these disasters with your affluence and your income levels. But now we're seeing that this smoke is even reaching across to the East Coast. So no longer can those in the wealthy privileged class can get away from it. But also with that in mind, we should also focus on the most vulnerable, such as the undocumented immigrants. Um, and it was me uh, Sonia mentioned that these are all people that are in the shadows or invisible to government. But I, I'm here to, to also remind everyone from our own research that we did with uh, Genevieve that these groups are rendered invisible because of issues of systemic racism and cultural norms of US citizenship and who's uh, deemed a worthy disaster victim. And under these processes, um, governments are not doing special considerations and planning before disaster for undocumented communities, even though they have been uh, working these lands in California and throughout the Southwest for decades, since the 1960s, many of them are even longer. And they are quite visible and part of our economy, yet human decisions, political decisions are really being made about not to put resources or not to expand our social safety net um, to protect these individuals. Genevieve is going to talk a little bit specific about the case study we did in uh, the 2017-2018 uh, Thomas wildfire in Ventura in Santa Barbara County, which until recently was the second largest wildfire in California's history, but the wildfire is now have displaced that um, in terms of uh, acreage. Uh, but I want to talk about some recent interviews I did in Sonoma County with some advocates on the impacts um, that happened in August and now in September as well to undocumented Im immigrants. Uh, one issue that we, we are seeing that uh, farm workers are continuing to harvest grapes in mandatory evacuation zones and that the Agricultural Commissioner um, in Sonoma and other agricultural uh, commissioners throughout California are issuing access verification passes, essentially exemptions to allow these workers to specifically go into these hazardous areas that are mandatory evacuation zones deemed hazardous air or a fire threat for the general population. But these individuals, um, uh, uh, farm workers are allowed to enter these unsafe areas. Um, they, they face a combination of toxic smokes, a lack of resources, um, as I mentioned before, no social safety network to protect them. And this is uh, particularly uh, important uh, uh, impacts on particular undocumented Latinos and indigenous uh, migrants from Mexico that are economically vulnerable and have no, oftentimes have no other choice but to continue to work in the fields to help support their family. And they cannot make um, uh, complaints and uh, and report uh, unfair labor practices to state government, oftentimes for fear of deportation. For example, in the Wall Bridge and Myers fires uh, that just happened for, um, in August and September, Sonoma County issued 375 access certification uh, passes to employers. The concern here is protecting the grapes from smoke and ash, which can damage the flavor of, of the wine. So governments here are prior to, to prioritizing employers and profits over the health and safety of undocumented workers. A statewide uh, protocol is needed for uh, future fires. Uh, there, it's very haphazard. Um, each county has its own rules and regulations. Some are stronger, some are just in name only. Uh, the state really needs to come in and create a statewide um, protocol. Uh, Cal Fire or uh, legal author police authority should determine who has the right to enter into an, a mandatory evacuation zones, and the agricultural commissioner should not be granted that um, right to issue those passes without strong consultation with Cal Fire and uh, sheriff and police forces. 
And then finally, um, the, the N95 mask requirement uh, here uh, in California that was adopted by advocates such as Genevieve who, uh, Genevieve, who will talk more about, needs to be strengthened um, because it, it's not universally upheld and it's not applied um, to all undocumented, uh, all farm workers throughout the state. So that's a brief snapshot of the current fires in Sonoma and, and uh, Monterey counties that I have uh, been get, getting access through through various interviews. But I'll hand it off to my co-author Genevieve Flores Hado for her um, impressions from on the ground working with um, these migrant communities. Sure. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Mendez. And I also just want to echo. Uh, just gratitude uh, to the UCLA Policy and Politics Initiative for, for convening um, this very timely conversation. Um, in terms of the published report, as Dr. Mendez mentioned, it looked at the Thomas fire in 2017 um, as a case study, right? Um, again, like you said, it was the second largest wildfire at the time. Um, and just having been on the ground, um, a lot of what we've seen, you know, are issues that were systemic prior to the wildfire, right? Um, you know, as we've mentioned, like a lack of access to healthcare, um, housing issues, economic issues. Um, for example, in Ventura County, where I'm based out of, um, you know, our ag industry is a $2 billion ag industry, um, but you have farm workers only making $15 to $20,000 a year. Um, so there's economic strains. Um, for the population that we work with at my organization, my COP, um, language, um, it's not enough to have Spanish. Our, our, our community speaks our indigenous languages, which in, in and of themselves have different variants um, that make them unintelligible between each other. Um, so you have to really get the right variant of the community that you're serving. Um, and of course, status status that, that prevents us from accessing different services, healthcare, again, state unemployment. And so the findings from the report were really just responses to what we saw um, as these problems were exacerbated by the fire. Um, and so in the paper, you know, we, we name linguistic and cultural competency. Um, immediately after the fire, one of our local assemblywoman, assemblywoman Monique Limon penned AB 1877, which would require language access in emergency services because at the time of the Thomas fire, it was 10 days into the fire before we had anything in Spanish, let alone anything in indigenous languages. Um, so that codified it uh, with AB 177, but we can take that a step further and include languages that are also spoken um, in the region. So again, in our area, it's Tagalog, it's the Misteco, it's Zapoteco, and how are we being responsive in, in times of crisis? Um, funding for community-based organization planning processes is another uh, takeaway, uh, which basically means how are you involving the community-based organizations to be a part of that planning process. Right now we have um, SB 160, um, again, which is a state law, which is requiring counties to, to update their, their, their emergency planning process, but infusing that with, with again, cultural and linguistic um, competency, but it's county by county and the counties are applying SB 160 as they need to update their plans. So it's, it's a very slow process at, at this point in time, um, really pushing for statewide disaster relief. Um, myself, I'm one of the co-founders of the 805 Docu Fund, which is a fund we launched in response to the Thomas Fire, and we've since had to relaunch it a couple times. Um, we had the Thomas Fire 2017, we had Wolseley Hill 2018, you know, Olive Fire 2019. The, these fires are more commonplace, and so our response needs to be more institutional. Um, and we recently relaunched again uh, in response to COVID-19, which I'll, I'll get into uh, later in the discussion. And again, um, to what Dr. Mendez was alluding to, occupational health and safety rights. You know, during the Thomas fire, we had a, a Cal OSHA office in, in, in Oxnard and they closed it because the air quality was so bad. Yet our farm workers were out there continuing to work and they had no one to file complaints to because the local office was closed. So we had to really pressure the Sacramento Cal OSHA office to open up the local office again to receive those complaints. Um, and in a time like COVID-19, where there's a scarcity of N95 masks, how can we truly distribute those and, and who gets to make those calls, right? Um, I know at the beginning of the pandemic for us, we had about 10,000 N95 masks just left over from all the fires and we donated to them. We donated them to local hospitals, healthcare systems, understanding that, you know, back in March, the need was just to get the, the PPE into healthcare workers. And now that we're in fire season, we're kind of just like, well, we're, we're a little bit stuck, you know what I mean? Um, and again, going back to health coverage for um, for undocumented workers, I, I, that that's that's the root of it. That's a lot of the work that I do here at my organization. Is if you don't have a medical home, you're only going to seek care when it's an emergency, when you're dying, basically. And so, how can we prevent more deaths and and and, and open up um, that for folks? And so, um, those are just the main takeaways from the paper itself. 
Um, and yeah, I can't wait to get into this conversation with everybody. Thank you. Great, thank you both. Um, let's maybe take a step back. Um, Valdemar, would you uh, be able to talk about, um, and, and Dr. Bendez and Genevieve uh, mentioned uh, this a little bit with respect to you know, healthcare and legal status, but can you talk about um, a little more in depth about what factors put um, immigrant workers, particularly agricultural workers, um, at risk when these disasters hit? Well, I, I think Genevieve uh, summed it up uh, very well, and Dr. Mendez, the vulnerability of undocumented people, uh, threat of deportation if they complain or raise an issue, or any need they may have, whether it's healthcare or anything. Um, uh, I, I think that the um, uh, one of the most important impediments is the lack of voice, the lack of redress, the lack of uh, ability to uh, have their their voices heard. And I have spent my entire life uh, trying to uh, help workers create that collective voice that they need to create what I call a, a constructive tensions in the agricultural industry. And um, what we've done in the Midwest is tried to redefine that uh, those constructive tensions in terms of uh, instead of coming from advocates, coming directly from workers in a supply chain uh, industry. Uh, in our part of the of the U.S., uh, the Midwest and the Deep South that, that runs from Michigan to Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee, North, South Carolina, Virginia, uh, on down to the coast. Um, we, have, we don't have a lot of corporate farms like you have on the West Coast. We have a lot of small family farms that have labor intensive crops. Now these farmers are about as marginalized as the farm workers are because they are suppliers to big retailers and, corp and um, uh, manufacturers like uh, the big tobacco companies, uh, like uh, Costco, like uh, Walmart, like uh, <clears throat> all the food, st uh, food store uh, chains. And so, uh, so what happens is that when you financially marginalize the supply chain, the people at the bottom, they lack the resources to have the mobility that what uh, Dr. Mendez was mentioning, uh, mobility to move around disasters, catastrophes or whatever. And they have access to healthcare, farm workers don't. And uh, somebody else commented what is absolutely the truth that farm workers don't seek medical care unless they're practically falling over because they can't, that keeps them from working. I remember as a, um, as a nine, 10 year old, I forget how old I was, I came down with hepatitis A. You know, that's, you get that from living in squalor and filthy conditions. As I was raised in those labor camps and uh, I, uh, I was, I was uh, working feverish uh, in the field uh, almost fainted uh, when I finally got to the doctor that, that diagnosed that hepatitis A. So, and, and that's only because I, uh, it, it kept me from working. It, if I had hepatitis A and I could still work, I'd still be working. And I think that's true for many farm workers. And uh, this summer we've, um, uh, what, what we did is that we, uh, in our, uh, we pioneered in the 80s the supply chain agreements. The first one was a big breakthrough with the Campbell Soup Company. We got them and all their tomato growers and cucumber growers to sit down and bargain the prices of the crops and what, what the farm workers would get. And part of that was the uh, taking care of the health and safety. Uh, for instance, the squalor in the labor camps. We created a program to renovate the housing stock to be amenable to families as opposed to single workers, you know, bunked in barracks and, and one room shanties and that sort of thing, and eliminated the common use facilities where there's a spread of viruses and germs and whatever. And now with COVID even more uh, important <clears throat> that you have that separation. Uh, and what we did with the uh, uh, labor camps, we renovated the housing stock, uh, but also negotiated the uh, the wages so that the children wouldn't have to work in the fields and they can be in school. And so um, uh, in a, when there is a catastrophe, when there was flooding and things like that, anything, it, it, like right now, it could be the wildfires, it could uh, it could be COVID, it could be uh, in, in, in our part of the country, we have hurricanes in North Carolina. 
We have one, maybe two hurricanes a year that causes all kinds of disasters. And so, but when workers are organized and have a collective voice, they also have a collective way of responding to these uh, disasters. And I think that's the nature of, of, a, of, of human organization in any society. When you're organized, you can best respond to a, a disaster uh, because sometimes, you know, the higher ups uh, who govern in government sort of are going to let you down. Our federal government has let us down on responding to this crisis nationally. Uh, some of our states have let us down. Some have responded better than others. But in the end, if the workers themselves have, a, have an ability to move, to navigate these things on their own, it's much better. For instance, uh, uh, in Ohio, one of the things that we created was a, a mobile migrant clinic. So instead of for the workers to take time off of work to go find a clinic, or go find somewhere to get some health care, we take the clinic out to the labor camps and, uh, and see them after work right there on the spot. We take doctors, we have our own, uh, uh, our own pharmacy that goes with the clinic. They get their prescriptions filled on the spot. They don't have to go anywhere. And so um, if we had Michigan, for instance, uh, this year mandated testing, uh, COVID testing in the labor camps. The Ohio uh, did not uh, mandate testing, but the results are the same. And the reason is because they don't have a practical program on the ground to make it happen, even if they had mandated testing. And I think that that's the key. We've, uh, I think with our, the, the Ohio Health Department has called on us to use our mobile clinic to get out to some of the farms. And we've been able to do that uh, successfully, but that's only because we have an organization of farm workers. We have a union. The workers pay dues. We're able to create the programs that service them directly for themselves. And instead of waiting in line for a handout from the federal government, we do it ourselves. So I think that um, uh, it, we've dealt with undocumented people from the beginning of our union uh, you know, in, the, in the late 60s in 67, we always had undocumented people. And, um, but I always make the point uh, to uh, immigration activists and others. I did that during the, when we were fighting the, uh, the amnesty of 86 with uh, President Reagan. And I was arguing, I said, look, um, yes, being undocumented creates an enormous amount of problems, but the, but the underlying uh, situation that really impacts the undocumented status is the economic marginalization of the workers. Because if you're undocumented and are rich, you wouldn't have the problems that undocumented and poor people have. And uh, so I, I, my argument was that, look, we need to get to the, uh, mar the economic marginalization of that population of people where migrant workers are employed, undocumented immigrants are employed. Because if you don't uplift their economic status, so you're going to have, instead of having uh, undocumented and exploited workers, you're going to have documented and exploited workers. So what's the difference? They're still marginalized. They're still going to be vulnerable to these catastrophes and so on. So um, I'm surprised you don't have somebody from the United Farm Workers on this panel. Uh, they're West Coast. They, they have a response and they have a, a very good uh, ability and have built a very good model of uh, being able to uh, weigh in on the public policy that it affects farm workers, but they can speak out for their members. And I think that uh, if we had a uh, hundred more flocks and and uh, UFWs around the country, I think the we could partner better with people like yourselves and others. You could use all that uh, intellectual uh, research and so on in order to implement and educate uh, the workers on the ground, so that they can take that information and figure out a way to uh, program themselves uh, to respond to these crises. Right. Thank you, Valdemar. Um, Genevieve, I, I wanted to ask you, how has the pandemic compounded the, the risks and the inequalities that are faced by essential workers, um, such as farm workers, but in particular, those who are indigenous? Um, and what have workers told you about the conditions um, during the fires burning right now in California? No, for sure. And um, yeah, so I think in terms of, of what, you know, COVID-19 has meant to our community, um, it kind of, again, breaks down to what we've seen with the fires, right? It's, it's a little bit dark, but in some, in some ways, the fires have kind of prepared us a little bit better than some areas for a COVID-19 response. 
Um, and it kind of falls along the lines, the same lines as, again, the immigration status has prevented them from accessing um, federal federal dollars. Um, there was the, the Governor Newsom 75 million um, uh, disaster relief for immigrant families. Um, the reality of that is, you know, we're, we're, and we were one of the organizations that was, you know, distributing those funds to, to farm workers in Ventura, Santa Barbara County. Um, the reality is that of, of that funding is that, you know, we were grateful for it. It's historic because I don't think any other state has done something like that for undocumented workers. Um, but it really only touched one in six undocumented Californians with a one time payment of $500. Um, and so, again, more is needed to, to support our families. Um, as, as, as mentioned, you know, the language barrier, you know, information is key, right? Um, so at our organization, we are fortunate to have a low power radio station. And so we have production capacity, we have the language capacity. So we've just been pushing out information um, as we get it, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, it was, what is COVID-19? And understanding that like in our indigenous languages that are over 3000 years old, there's no word for virus. So trying to describe what are the symptoms, um, like what does it mean? Um, and how, how can you social distance at home when you're a family of five renting a room in a three bedroom house? You know, how can we, um, you know, you know, support families with that. Um, and then labor issues, um, that's kind of been like the biggest, the biggest thing that we're trying to tackle at this moment is, um, you know, there, there's good policy on the top. I know many counties across California have issued agriculture advisories, um, but what trickles down to the worker is completely different than what the ag advisory attention is. Um, and above them, I mentioned, you know, little fa family farms and like the bigger, more industrial farms, it's the little family farms that are having a harder time carrying out the ag advisory and, and what we've heard from our families and from from our leaders is you know there are threats there are threats that if you get COVID-19 we're not renewing your contract or uh, we're laying you off and even to the extent that we're going to lay you off and also your whole crew because you have COVID-19 so there's a real fear and concern to not want to report a positive COVID-19 um, you know um, diagnosis and then in our region in particular with uh, we're kind of working with h2a workers um, because we've had a couple different um, what of this like outbreaks in in h2a housing um, so how we're trying to work with our local public health department to better support h2a workers in Santa Barbara County um, we had a public uh, health order from the public health director to protect h2a workers and to kind of Put, make them their own pods so that they can work together, go grocery shopping together, eat together, um, and trying to work on that with Ventura County. And so, um, and then kind of going out to like rent, you know, in, in California it's expensive, right? It's expensive to not to, to even rent. In, in Ventura County median uh, two bedroom apartment is $1,900 a month. And as I mentioned, you know, farm workers are bringing in $15,000, $20,000 a year. And so our families, um, we're not late on our rent. Our families are paying our rent. But what we're doing is we're taking out money from like our cousin, our Thea, a loan shark. And so how once, you know, everything's over and they have to pay back the money, how can we support them with that? Um, and then in terms of the fires, um, you know, again, we're in Southern California. Um, right now, what we're dealing with is just the bad air quality. There haven't been any big fires like there are up in Northern California. Um, and so I think that's just kind of what we've heard from our folks is there's a more awareness of how of like that you shouldn't be working in poor air quality. There's more of our folks, you know, asking their employers for protection if the air quality dips. Um, and I think more than anything, there's an awareness with our leaders that like, you know, we're not heroes. You know, a lot of people want to say, oh, they're heroes, they're working, they're essential. It's like, no, there are systems in place that are keeping us in our place of employment. There's like structural inequities that are keeping us in the field. We'd much rather be at home safe with our kids, you know? Um, so I just wanted to name that for this panel. So thank you. That's a really good point. Um, thank you. And just to remind everyone, I'm sorry, we're running out of uh, time a little bit here. So if everyone can keep comments uh, brief to, to a few minutes. Um, Mayor Tovar, um, so I know Arizona is prone to disasters, including thunderstorms and floods and lightning strikes and wildfires and drought and dust storms. Okay, that's a lot of things. Um, but a little bit different than California. So I wanted to ask what your goals been, um, you know, first as a state legislator years ago, and then now as mayor with respect to assisting undocumented folks and helping them recover from those types of disasters in your community specifically. Thank you, Andrea. That's a great question. I would say my goal is, as a public servant has always been to advocate uh, for our, our undocumented 
Um, I've also worked and established a great relationship with our Mexican consulate to understand the needs of our undocumented and how disasters impact them. And I remain committed as a lifelong learner and an advocate for programs to help our community. Uh, one of the things that I'm, I'm advocating for is within our consulates here in Arizona is to coordinate the disaster planning with each of their uh, counties. So right now in Maricopa County, where I'm at and where my city is at, our Mexican county coordinates with the Maricopa County Community Active uh, for Disasters. It's an independent group of organizations and they offer vital services uh, to our community so that um, in case an emergency does happen or when it happens, they're able to facilitate that support services uh, to reach the impacted communities. Uh, the last one was a fire that we had here in Arizona where um, at that point there was a database of whoever um, had registered at the Mexican consulate and then from there uh, the services were rendered in that community um, and it was within I would say 12 hours where they had people on the ground um, searching for our families uh, offering solutions and offering services as well too. Um, also here in Arizona I know Genevieve had mentioned um, a, a fund uh, in California, we have a similar fund here in Arizona, which is the Arizona Undocumented Workers Relief Fund. Uh, that raised, since COVID, about $2.1 million. Uh, we're going to be going out again uh, to reactivate and get more funds because those funds have already since ceased. Um, and again, I mean, it, it was just the tip of the iceberg in regards to um, our most vulnerable families that needed that assistance. Um, so that was something that we'll continue on doing. And last but not least, here in Arizona, as you as you know, we have just a history of anti-immigrant legislation. I seen it when I was in the state legislature, and it really brought a, a black eye uh, to Arizona. Uh, since then, you know, there has been some positive things that have come out, which were our activists during SB 1070. We have quite a few now that are in leadership positions uh, that are at the state legislature right now, um, advocating and representing their communities, and also educating and empowering our communities of what the rules and what their rights are as well too. Uh, one of the big hot topic issues that last year in the state legislature that we we're trying to pass was the counselor ID uh, to offer uh, those with an at least identification uh, that sadly did not pass but just a couple of weeks ago our Arizona cities and towns have pushed for a unanimous support and approval of that law so hopefully in the next coming legislature session we can get that passed as well too. Thanks so much for that Mayor Tovar um, and, and just to uh, remind everyone tuning in um, you're definitely encouraged to ask any questions using the Q&A function. Um, so please, please do send us your questions. I'm happy to ask the panel. Um, uh, back to uh, Valdemar. So uh, kind of going off of what Mayor Tovar was saying, um, uh, you know, things, uh, disasters in Ohio uh, are a little bit different from California as well. You know, flash floods, tornadoes. Um, what are some disasters that stand out in your memory, um, and, and how did your organization respond to those? Uh, well, uh, a, a year ago, a year and a half ago, we had a very serious uh, hurricane in North Carolina. It, uh, some of the labor camps were underwater and uh, lost a lot of the crops. And of course, there was a, a, a big health crisis, a big health need. Um, we dispatched our mobile clinic from Ohio to North Carolina and um, they spent, um, I, I think they uh, took in some four or five hundred people over a three day weekend. Uh, well, that's just in one weekend. And um, uh, we were able to respond to it that way and meet the needs of the, uh, of the members and their families and their co-workers uh, yeah, but that's only like a, a drop in the head compared to the entire state of North Carolina uh, or other areas that were impacted by that hurricane uh, uh, we can respond we have limits to what we can respond with um, but if we had better governance uh, in our uh, 
political environment, uh, which makes it very difficult these days, uh, in order to respond to the people who are marginalized in those rural, remote labor camps, especially. If you're poor and in a city, you're more likely to get some kind of uh, help and support than the farm workers who are out of sight, out of mind. And so I think that um, uh, we try to create as much noise as we can about it. Uh, but one of the things that we're challenged right now, and we've had a campaign going on against these big tobacco companies, that's RJ Reynolds, uh, that's owned a wholly owned subsidiary of British American Tobacco, um, a Alliance One and Universal Leaf to buy all the tobacco for Philip Morris International. Uh, these are the big, this is the backbone of agriculture uh, in the deep south. And um, we're trying to hold them accountable the way we hold Campbell Soup, Heinz USA, Dean Foods, and other manufacturers accountable to the impact of these disasters and the bottom of their supply chains. And uh, right now we, uh, we are sort of departing a little bit from other advocates who really want uh, uh, some kind of mandates uh, to respond to the current uh, COVID crisis for farm workers in North Carolina. Uh, you know, those, that voice is good, but it would be better uh, if we were adding demands on the manufacturers who have the money to make the kind of safe, uh, uh, create a safer workplace situation that the small family farmers don't have the money to do. Somebody mentioned earlier that the small family farmers have a harder uh, time meeting some of the requirements that are being imposed on them. But it's true of any small operator. And I think that if the, if the manufacturers like the Reynolds Tobacco uh, could pump money into the supply chain to make possible uh, the kind of changes that's required to run a safe operation in agriculture and protect those workers. Uh, uh, only then, unless you answer the financial question, it's going to be hard to respond to some of those uh, to some of those needs that the workers have. And I think that that's our our mission uh, as as a farm worker organization. We are a democratic organization. I I'm not president because I say I am. I have to get elected. I have to get elected again next year if I'm going to stay in this position. <clears throat> and so we want workers to have control of their own voice. And um, and I think this is one of the collective demands that we are putting out there right now against these big manufacturers, not just Reynolds America, but all the buyers of the commodities. Uh, our, our members, are, we have, uh, we cover, our agreements cover over 9,000, almost 10,000 workers on uh, close to 700 farms in the state of North Carolina. And um, uh, and they harvest uh, 30, 40 different crops, everything from strawberries, wine grapes, uh, but tobacco is one of the big crops that runs through the backbone of the, of the system there. And I think that um, if we get these uh, manufacturers and retailers and make them accountable, it would be much, much easier to have the resources to respond. Why should the taxpayers have to pay for this? And, and, and all the issues that farm workers have, and when they talk, when you talk, when uh, Genevieve talks about their income uh, and everything, it sort of boggles my mind after all these years that um, everybody admits that farm workers are the hardest working people in the world, and uh, or some of the hardest working people in the world. Yet, how is it that they work so hard, and still qualify for food stamps, they still qualify for all these handouts? I mean, that's not, kind of like an oxymoron. And um, you, you'd think that if they work that hard, that many hours a day, that many days a week, you ought to be able to have enough income to pay for your own food, health, uh, all kinds of care that uh, and, and, and any human being needs. And so I think that that really uh, underscores the lack of the pricing in the supply chains that's driven and imposed on the bottom players of the industry by huge global corporations. Thank you, Valdemar. Um, we've got some questions in the queue. So um, maybe, Mayor Tabak, can you answer this one? Um, what, what policy changes are you advocating for now or would you be advocating for in the coming year to address these issues um, in your community? That's a great question. I would say my role as a mayor is to advocate uh, for progressive changes uh, for our, our undocumented 
workers here in Arizona. I know during these times of COVID, uh, we've seen just uh, these barriers exacerbate regarding to education, regarding to our digital divide, regarding to um, status and fear. Um, here in Arizona, it's that big fear of, you know, ever since what happened with SB 1070 of uh, we need to educate and empower and we need to uh, remove these barriers so that, uh, you know, it isn't as difficult to get resources uh, and to understand. So for me, I here in my city would just COVID-19, you know, the vast majority of my community, 90% Latino, um, they do not have the luxury of staying home in regards to working from home, but yet they're working long hours and then they're coming home and the digital divide impacts them and their family when it comes to have school online with COVID. So for me, I see Google as, as a, a problem uh, bringing solutions to these problems. Uh, we're the, one of the first cities here in Arizona to have a 24-7 COVID-19 testing center, uh, which didn't ask for your identification. Um, and that was uh, essentially very crucial as well, too. Uh, also, my city is home to the only meatpacking plant here in the state of Arizona, uh, which, you know, before COVID had its it's buried, uh, but even more so now during COVID. So for me, I am calling upon to make positive changes, you know, those safety changes that are very essential for our workers, um, not more so now than ever. And, you know, for me, it's, it's bringing that to light to uh, my counterparts, my other, you know, mayors across the state that may not feel the impacts that my community is feeling, but to educate them and to advocate, to ask them to advocate with me uh, to bring solutions, whether it's at our local level or at a state legislative level. Level. I mean, I, I would say it's so easy for people to go um, and buy meat at a grocery store without even thinking about who cleaned it, who prepared it, who cut it up and packaged it. Uh, these are things that people need to realize that are happening here in our community. Um, and people are risking their lives day in and day out um, and have these barriers that prevent them from succeeding and moving on. Um, and so for me, my role is to bring that awareness, that empowerment, educate and start a collaboration with other mayors, legislators, so that we can bring solutions uh, to our communities. Thank you. Um, another question, I think this could go to Genevieve. Um, how are organizations like yours uh, planning to or, or trying to leverage the unprecedented attention of the American public on um, the reliance of undocumented workers, including undocumented farm workers, to push for immigration reform and also to advocate for better working and living conditions for the workers themselves? Yeah, I mean, I think that's absolutely a, a great question and it's very timely, right? I think the, the policy advocacy work that we're working on is at the moment um, county and state focus. So it's more so better better working conditions, uh, quite frankly, to Baldonar's point, better pay just because our folks can't afford to even buy the crops that they're, they're picking. Um, and so I think the other part of it too is when we have these these moments like what we're living in now is is also kind of how do you parlay that into into dollars um, into mutual aid to go back to farm workers um, again I mentioned the 805 and Docu Fund um, again there's a couple other things in the county that 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 are coming up to support specifically farm workers um, but it's definitely uh, the need to to push for for something like the, um, the blue card program which is at the federal level to try to get a pathway to citizenship for farm workers um, you know understanding that a lot of our families are mixed status there's there's daca um so i i think it's it's just a collectively we're going to need to 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 work together to to respond to to support these workers in in, in these ones right again better pay the immigration status piece um etc um dr mendez um can you talk about the the connection between these you know, sort of point in time disasters uh, and climate change and sort of what that means for vulnerable populations, including undocumented folks. Oh, sorry, I think you're muted. Yes, thank you for that important question. As I started um, uh, this webinar earlier, talking about that connection to climate change and understanding that um, there, there's a compounding of disasters that multiple hazard events are, are more likely uh, to occur simultaneously because of human cause uh, climate change, because of 
uh, we continually put carbon emissions into our, our global uh, atmosphere that's affecting um, our climate and extreme weather events. So we're gonna see more and more of these simultaneous heat waves, droughts, and wildfires, which were experienced all three in California and I know out in other places in the Southwest. So that puts individuals, um, uh, particularly those that are stigmatized and most marginalized at most risk for this, these compounding disasters, these cascading health effects that come from these multiple uh, simultaneous disaster events. So the pre-disaster uh, marginalized status of undocumented immigrants, their economic uh, status, uh, their, their lack of uh, legal status, and not being able to engage in social safety network programs such as FEMA, um, uh, unemployment assistance fund, and of course, healthcare issues puts them at uh, particular risk. So I think some of the, the key things that we have advocated, Genevieve Vivai, and sort of these policy briefings that we've had with the governor's office and various other entities is ensuring that there's a stronger social safety network. That yes, it's historic and it's important that the governor uh, was pushed to uh, through the, the California Latino Legislative Caucus to enact this undocumented fund, uh, this one-time um, temporary undoc undocumented disaster relief fund, but that needs to be uh, done permanent. And understanding that these essential workers, these workers are continually going to be working um, in the breadbasket of the country, providing food and other uh, essential services uh, for, for the entire state and the country, and we have to plan ahead. And th these individuals are rendered again invisible because of the policy choices that we are making. So, uh, other types of issue because of our changing climate, we need to have stronger um, engagement between um, our county offices and, and local air quality. Uh, we have this um, this this emergency regulation uh, with Cal OSHA, our Occupational Health and Safety, that requires masks uh, to be distributed when the air quality index is at 150, uh, one which is considered unhealthy. But because the very nature, particularly of farm workers, of the work, the work that they do, they're, they're constantly in, uh, uh, exposed to pesticides, dust, and other types of particulate matter, they're already, by definition, a sensitive population. So when the air quality index reaches 100 and, um, I believe, 101, uh, that's when a sensitive population should not be outside, should, should have protective equipment. So that air quality standard um, that Kawasha has should be brought down to 101, and uh, uh, farmers and employers should be required to provide these N95 masks. And other policy changes that uh, I would encourage, again, is ensuring that um, air quality, uh, the air quality monitoring that is done is not done by the employers, but is done by uh, state agencies that are, are reputable, that have the, the proper local air quality handheld monitoring, not monitoring that's done somewhere far away that's just the, of the ambient air, but one that's actually in the field where the people are actually working. And then finally, again, taking that uh, right away from agricultural commissioners to issue these access uh, exemptions to enter mandatory evacuation zones. And these undocumented immigrants in particular have no recourse because um, uh, there's no state law that, uh, that prevents an employer to, to uh, have a retribution on an uh, employee that does not want to work in mandatory uh, evacuation zone. So there's no uh, rights there. So we need to talk about that more in our policymaking process. Particularly the changing climate that these disasters and extreme weather events are going to happen more often and simultaneously. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mendez. Um, we have another question in the uh, in the question box. Um, somebody asks, you know, these some of these disasters are slow moving, um, such as drought, which California dealt with recently, um, and of course sea level rise. Um, are there any long term efforts that could help farm workers and indigenous communities um, whose residential areas and work sites would be slowly but consistently impacted over time? For sure. Um, so part of the work that, that I, I also cover for the organization is this climate resiliency, climate adaptation work that I honestly only got into because of the Thomas fire and because of, of the need, right? Um, so what we've done is we are part of a, a network um, in the Central Coast, of specifically that is uh, environmental justice groups and immigrant advocates, immigrant farm worker advocates. And it's a very unique space where we're trying to figure out what it, what is it gonna take to, to protect our frontline communities um, 
What is it? What does a Green New Deal look like for the Central Coast, and how are we uplifting, you know, frontline communities' voices um, in these spaces? So it's not just someone like me. It's not just like an executive director of a climate group. It's the leaders that are really connecting because, you know, as Indigenous folks, we have that connection to the land. We are that stewards of the land. And I know in California, there's also a push in terms of just the fire piece to to give land steward stewardship back to indigenous tribes that pri practice tribal burning, uh, controlled burning for our region. And so I think that kind of 10 year, 20 or 30 year planning is, is starting at least in our region. And again, really trying to center, you know, our folks in those seats and in, in those decision making capacities. Thanks, Genevieve. Um, another question from the audience. Um, have there been any issues, and this is this is really relevant right now, have there been any issues um, executing evacuations for undocumented farm workers during wildfires because of the accessibility and the communication issues? Although I know that um, you mentioned um, some of those folks have continued to just work uh, during evacuations. I, I think I could answer that. At least in the Sonoma fires, there were documented cases where individ uh, uh, individuals uh, primary Latino immigrants and uh, indigenous immigrants in that area that were trying to leave it at mandatory evacuation zones. But uh, gas stations um, uh, shut down and many of these individuals, because gas is so expensive, didn't have enough gas uh, to, to leave the area. So many of them were uh, being able to, uh, being stuck uh, within the mandatory and involuntary evacuation zones and others um, have, that did have a little bit more mobility had nowhere to go. They couldn't go to the shelter areas for fear of deportation uh, there. Uh, so many of them had started to camp on the beach uh, because they had nowhere else. It was free and um, it was cleaner air. So another key issue that we also have to uh, remember is that while well, undocumented immigrants are unable to access uh, federal disaster relief funds, mixed households are able to uh, uh, gain some of this. So if you're a mixed household, uh, that, that is uh, somebody that's a U.S. legal resident or a U.S. citizen, and there's undocumented immigrants, that person that's legal or a U.S. citizen can apply for these federal disaster relief funds. But what's happening now, um, because of the uh, Trump administration of the public charge rule, so if you're an undocumented immigrant and you get some type of public assistance from the gov government, you can be disqualified for uh, le legal status. Um, the, the, the federal Stanford Act, the Disaster Stanford Act, exempts disaster funds. But still, that fear is uh, put into undocumented immigrants. So these mixed households are not doing this because some of the, um, the forms that are being filled out for these wildfire events and other disasters specifically says at the bottom of the application that the information contained in the application will be um, shared with Homeland Security and ICE. So that's further um, disenfranchising and making vulnerable even mixed households. That's all very good to know. Thank you, Dr. Mendez. Um, so Genevieve, during the Thomas fire, um, I know that local organizations such as yours um, stepped up to fill the void that was left by government agencies um, and disaster relief organizations. Um, can you talk about what would happen if advocates um, did not exist to help folks and specifically some of the you know, rural parts of California and rural parts of the country? Um, yeah, I, I think had had we not been there, had other advocate groups not been there, we just quite frankly would have been left out. Um, everything would have been left in English. Um, everything, you know, to, to the previous question, right, like folks being unable to evacuate, um, you know, they, they would have just been left in place. I, I, I do recall, uh, you know, giving an interview to a reporter for a local paper um, about the, the language access piece, right? And she asked me, but nobody died, right? Because they didn't get the information. And it's like, we shouldn't have to wait for someone to die before we make that kind of change. Um, and, and so, you know, we've seen a lot of really great changes, um, kind of bringing it back to Ventura County, like we have, you know, public information officers that are now in Spanish, we have county staff that are now trilingual indigenous languages that have been really able to step up and step in. Um, and we wouldn't have any of that had had the advocacy work not happened. Um, and so we're going to continue to do that work. We're going to continue to, you know, make folks uncomfortable because the reality is, is, you know, we've made strides, but there's still so much more that that needs to be done to truly protect everyone um, during a disaster. Thank you. 
Um, Mayor Tovar, can, can you talk about um, how, how do you see climate change manifesting in Arizona and um, how are the effects manifesting in your uh, underserved populations in that state? And how, how do you see um, policy change in Arizona when it comes to uh, reacting to climate change specifically? Oh, sorry, I think you're muted. <laughs> okay, um, as I would say, as Dr. Mendez had mentioned, we are in a climate emergency uh, here in Arizona as well too. Uh, we're seeing it with this, the different disasters that are happening, uh, number one, more frequently, but number two, to a grander scale. Um, so those that don't believe in climate change, the facts are right in front of us. The disasters, again, are proving to us um, that we are in a climate emergency. As far as policies, I'm working within, um, right now, my organization, our city, uh, in trying to lead uh, positive and progressive climate change policies to help our, our community uh, with that as well, too. But I, I think from a Arizona perspective, um, I'm also running for the Arizona Corporation Commission because I feel so passionately and deeply about this issue that we need to see changes um, at a state level. And this is for, in our case in Arizona, this is the only day, way that we're going to be moving uh, towards renewable energies, uh, bringing that accountability back and making sure that we are leaving um, our state a better state for our children uh, and for generations to come as well too. The time to act is now. Um, so that's why I am uh, going to be leading that charge at the Corporation Commission, because I feel that I will be there to represent um, our communities, our most vulnerable communities, our migrant workers, um, our undocumented workers as well too. Um, one thing that I've learned being in public service is that you need to go to the community, you need to hear what issues that are concerning of them, and then as a public servant, you need to be that advocate, you need to be that voice that pushes those issues, um, otherwise those issues will be on the menu. Um, you know, for others just to have those rules that are not beneficial and not accommodating to your communities. For me, this issue runs deep. Um, I myself in my early 20s um, uh, had cancer and it was a leukemia that was brought uh, by a, an environmental toxin that entered my immune system. So for me, I don't want another single person in Arizona to go through what I went through. Um, and at the rate that we're going, we're going to see more cases of cancer. We're going to see more issues of uh, you know, dirty water and of, of clean air as well, too. We need that for all of our families to be productive and even more so with our underserved communities and those that um, are have these issues day in and day out because of the work that they do um, in our farms. So for me, I can hear my grandfather speaking to me, who was a migrant farm worker, and saying, you know, don't ever forget where you come from and always making sure that you're representing the people that have helped me get where I am today. Very good. Thank you for sharing that, Mayor Tovar. Um, and we've, we're running out of time here, but uh, I just wanted to ask, um, maybe everyone can uh, share a 20 second takeaway from the conversation. Um, maybe let's uh, start with Valdemar. I just want to add to, in closing uh, the discussion you just had that it's why we should pay attention to these uh, trade deals that we have with our neighboring countries, Canada and Mexico, uh, and take into consideration the ramifications, the, the uh, negative impact of these trade agreements. Uh, climate change, uh, migration are very uh, much equated. We hear stories from our Guatemalan members uh, about, uh, well, the crops don't grow the same in the mountains in Guatemala like they used to. And this forces them out of there to migrate somewhere. And, and the migration, in other, why is an immigration not tied to our trade deals? Uh, why don't we have a visa that allows a worker to, to travel freely in the countries that have signed these trade agreements? Because anytime there's trade agreements which are heavily weighed uh, in favor of investors, uh, it's going to cause displacement of, of people. NAFTA proved that we displaced, uh, I don't know how many million corn farmers in, in Mexico, 
they fled they fled to the cities and the cities got flooded with uh, with people and they crossed the border the the increase in immigration that happened and the first increase in immigration to the U.S. in those first three years of NAFTA was a direct consequence of that. So we should be paying attention to these trade deals and inject some of these issues in terms of long-term solutions. Um, we ought to have a visa that travel people travel freely. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Twenty seconds. Key takeaways. Just one thing I'd just like to add is just how the importance of that cross-sector partnership to support communities is. I think we see it reflected here between government, between private sector, between the for-profit sector. Um, you know, and at the risk of sounding cheesy, it's going to take all of us really to support these frontline communities. And and like I said earlier, you know, we're not always going to agree on everything. There's going to be you know moments of discomfort, but I think we just need to remind ourselves that at the end of the day, if there's a good partnership in place, we're there to support the same community. Um, because like it or not, this is our new normal. Uh, and this is what we're going to have to deal with for the next, again, 10, 20, 30 years, fires, droughts, floods, freezes, et cetera. So it's going to take all of us doing our part to really support our undocumented immigrant, indigenous migrant communities. Thanks, Genevieve. Thank you. And I'd just like to acknowledge the work that Genevieve does and moving forward, the state of California. She, she's a bit humble here. She's one, and she, she has be, by default become one of the leading experts on disaster policy in the state, particularly for vulnerable communities. And it takes uh, the power of social movements to move governments. And uh, here we see how um, the disaster issue, particularly for undocumented migrant communities, is an environmental justice issue, is an environmental and a climate justice and a racial justice issue. And we got to keep that in mind as we move forward and we build these coalitions. Uh, of the willing and, and these coalitions with our, our civil society as well as governments and ensuring that um, these these invisible and as you see from the title of our webinar invisible the I N is in quotes because again we're, these groups are rendered invisible by the direct policy decisions that we're making and the work that we're, we're talking about here and doing out in, the, in Arizona and California throughout the United States is honoring these these groups are worthy of protection, worthy of safeguarding, worthy of pre-disaster um, planning and putting in resources, not in reactionary manner, but proactively, because California, Arizona, it's a place with a history of disasters. And many of these disasters now, unfortunately, are foreseeable. We know we're gonna have more wildfires. We know we're gonna have more heat waves and hurricanes and other places as well. So now it's the time to help safeguard our most stigmatized and vulnerable communities. And thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Mayor Thawab? Well, thank you. I echo the comments that have been said by the panelists, and I totally agree that each of us play that crucial role of proactive solutions for our communities. Um, I, I would ask Genevieve and Dr. Mendez, I invite you to Arizona at any time uh, to help as well, too. You're doing amazing work in, in California, and we could only, uh, here in Arizona, emulate to what is of the progressive changes that are happening in California. But we are trying and we'll continue pushing issues every single day and I look forward to working more with you. Thank you, thank you for your work too. Thank you so much everyone for being here. Um, just to wrap it up, I, you know, it's so important to have these conversations um, to make sure that vulnerable populations, including undocumented immigrants are not left out of the planning and then the reflection of these natural disasters um, and you know based on this conversation it's obvious that th these issues are not going to be going away anytime soon so i appreciate everyone for being here thanks so much for listening Thank you. take care Oops. bye